Okay, it's fine. <clears throat> okay. Guys, you know the routine, right? The routine is pray that the Lord Jesus will wash us in his blood. Pray the Lord Jesus will crucify our flesh. Pray the Lord Jesus will forgive us and have mercy <clears throat> upon us and be patient with us as he empowers us by the Spirit to die to our flesh and walk in the life and power of the Holy Spirit. Pray the Lord Jesus bless the internet connection because you guys know that where I'm at, the internet connection is not the best, but this is all I can do until, in Jesus' name, I find my own place within the upcoming month or two. So I really need your prayers for all that, right? I need you to pray that the Lord Jesus in his mercy will open a door, a blessing, to find the place for me to <clears throat> settle in. I'll be joined with my brother and with the hopes that Jesus will plant me here and bring my daughters to me sooner than later, right? I really need your prayers. And ask the Lord Jesus to have mercy on us and be patient with us, especially as we fail and succumb to the flesh, to give us power to die to the flesh, repent, and walk in the life of the Spirit. Amen? So I just wanted to say something to our dear brother Gabriel. Gabriel, I don't know of any Christian who doesn't struggle with the issues you struggle with, especially men who are single. I don't want you to let guilt <clears throat> consume you to the point that you feel that you're not worthy to go before Jesus and beg Jesus for mercy and forgiveness because that's the trick of the devil. Are you listening, Gabriel? Are you listening to me, Brother Gabriel? I just want to be an encouragement to you. Brother, I myself am now a single man. Like you, I too struggle. I have carnal desires and loneliness. And I know how the enemy works, Gabriel. So I want to give you a word of exhortation and encouragement. <clears throat> the fact that you are convicted by your moral failures and the fact that it's bothering you is a good sign that the Spirit is working in your life because someone who's dead to the things of God doesn't care, doesn't bother him or her. But the fact you're bothered is a good sign. But I want you to be aware of how the enemy works. What Satan likes to do is make you feel so guilty that he drowns you in your guilt that you feel too ashamed of ever going before the feet of Jesus and asking Jesus to have mercy and to <clears throat> be patient with you and give you the power of the Spirit to walk in holiness. Because if he keeps you away from Jesus, you're going to get weaker and weaker and weaker until you finally fall away into sin and you don't care anymore. Do not let Satan deceive you. Take Jesus at his word. Trust Jesus when he says, if you confess, he is faithful to forgive you of your sins. Okay, Gabriel? Believe me, brother. I struggle too. I am weak too. I get lonely too. All of us. You're not the only one, brother. And anyone who truly loves Jesus will not condemn you for your struggles. The only time you rebuke someone is when someone is justifying their sin and succumbing to their carnal desires. That's when someone needs to be rebuked. But someone who's honestly struggling and feeling guilty and remorse over their struggles or succumbing to them, that brother, that sister is not to be rebuked, but encouraged, loved, and prayed for. Yeah, and Gabriel, do me a favor, brother. What I want you to do is don't be so open with your sins, not because I want to justify your sins, but because not everyone has your best interests. Not everyone <clears throat> cares for you so that when you air your sins, they're not going to be considerate and compassionate. They're going to use it to bash you and discredit you. What you need to do is, number one, you and your wife need to find a solid local church with solid, spiritually mature elders and ask them for help, ask them for counseling, and be accountable to them. Okay, brother? I say this because I do love you for the sake of Jesus. I may not love any of you perfectly, because, again, I'm human, 
I have my own issues, but when someone is sincere about their struggles, <clears throat> you won't find me bashing that person. But Gabriel, listen to me, brother. Thank you for trusting in us, uh, trusting us enough to confess whatever it is, but listen to me and hear this counsel. Don't be so open about your sins in a public forum because I'm telling you, there are snakes, wolves, <clears throat> and sheep's clothing, children of the devil who want to hear something bad about Christians to use, use that to bash Christians, discredit them, and bring shame to the name of Jesus. Okay, brother? We, we here love you and we encourage you, but now here's what you need to do. Listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. Find you a local church where the eldership consists of spiritually mature brothers in Jesus who know the word and try to live the word, who can counsel you. Find someone there to be accountable to, to meet regularly so they can pray for you and watch over you. Are you with me there? Are you listening? So now listen to me, Gabriel. It's because I love you. I know people think I can be harsh and a jerk, and I can be. But to my brothers and sisters who are sincere and struggle, I want to show you love and compassion, just like I want Jesus to show me love and compassion and not bash me. Listen to my advice, brother. Don't be so open with your issues in a public forum. You have sons of Satan, sons of Belial, who are here to try to find dirt on the body of Christ. Okay? Are you listening to me? Yes, exactly, like Muslims. How you doing, brother? Big Al, I love you, bro. Yes, Gabriel, the sons of Satan are everywhere. They're going to be on my channel. They're going to be in your church. They're everywhere, wolves in sheep's clothing, pretending to be Christian. Of course, Gabriel, especially on my channel. You're going to have people who hate me, who only come to my channel to find something to criticize, find something to use to discredit me and bash me so that no one takes me seriously. Of course they're going to be here, man. So guard yourself. Don't be so open. Yeah. Do you think that everyone who comes to my channel is because they love me or love Jesus and his word? They're here because they want to see me lose my temper, say something <clears throat> that is very direct and in your face, to go back and say, see, where's Jesus and Sam? I don't see the love. Look how nasty he is. Come on, brother. I've been around long enough to know it. In fact, you know who has given me the hardest time in my life? You know who have been the worst thorns in my side? Those who profess, profess to be Christian who, who claim to love me. Right? I expect Muslims to bash me and hate me. I expect atheists to bash me and hate me. I expect Joe's witnesses to bash me and hate me. But see, Satan is smart. When someone cl comes claiming to be a Christian, your guard is down and you open your heart thinking this person's a Christian and that person for the sake of Jesus has your best interests in mind. And yet those are the snakes that J Satan sends in order to win your trust and betray you. Remember who betrayed Jesus and handed him over to be killed. It wasn't an unbeliever, but someone who claimed to be a follower of Jesus, Judas Iscariot. Are you with me there? So please, listen. Don't be too open with your sins. That's something you need to confess to your elders in a local church. Because when you put something out in social media, unless I delete the video, people are going to read what you said. 
And even though you're comfortable with us, maybe your wife is not comfortable. Maybe your wife doesn't want you to come out publicly and tell people what your struggles are because she doesn't want to be embarrassed. So for the sake of your wife and even your children, you don't want to put too much out there because you don't want it to get back to your wife and children. Are you with me there? Are you understand what I'm getting at? Let me tell you what Paul says in Romans 14. Listen to this. Paul says, if eating meat will cause a weaker brother to stumble, then for the sake of that brother, I won't eat meat in front of him. And eating meat is good. It's acceptable. It's lawful. It's permitted. But Paul is saying, even if something lawful for me will cause someone else to stumble, if I do it, for his sake, I won't do it. How much more will you cause, maybe your wife and children stumble, hearing their, her husband or her father or their father saying, I do this. Be wise, brother. Be wise. Yes, listen to what Al is saying. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, Al Dariush is actually one of the dearest brothers to my heart, a brother I love from my heart, who actually used to come to my Bible studies. So we know it's your face to face. I used to go to his home, pray for him and his family, that God will bless him abundantly and preserve his family. If you want to know who are some of my family members, when I say family, spiritual brothers and sisters who have shared their life with me and I've shared my life with them, who've actually proven to be <clears throat> people who love me from the heart, Al Darius is one of them. Just want you to know that. He's a man I can trust and I do trust by the grace of Jesus because he loves Jesus. So pray for him. Pray for this brother. And pray, please, that now in this new location, I'll be planted and I'll stay here and that my girls will come to me in Jesus' name. Andrew, good to see you. I hope you listened to yesterday's session. So, Gabriel, take this advice. Please, brother, please do me a favor, brother. Don't be so open in a public forum. Okay? Please, I say this because I love you for the sake of Jesus. What I want you to do, find a local church with solid, mature, spiritual leaders. Open up to them, seek their counsel, and be accountable to them. May God purify my heart and my motives and the blood of Jesus to do it for the glory of Christ and not for the praise of men. Because I'm tainted and I need the Spirit to sanctify me, all of us. Okay? So listen, don't be so open. Now with me at times, I'm very open about my private issues. You know why? Because I'm at a point I don't care if people bash me. But at the same time, I need to be careful because I can't think about whether I care or not because I have to think now and be cautious whether what I say will affect others who do care. So I, too, need to be a little more discerning because I don't, honestly, I'm being honest with you guys. I don't care if someone bashes me and says, oh, Sam has got anger issues or, you know, his ex-wife left him. I've had Muslims even tell me, I don't blame your ex-wife for leaving you. They don't, they don't understand. I don't care what you think. But I have to now be a little more cautious and say, okay, I may not care, but what about others? Will it affect them? Do they care? So I need to be a little sensitive for their sake. So pray for that discernment. Okay? Vine, they do it all the time, brother. All right? Thank you, soldier. Pray I get healthier and more handsome and holier for Jesus. Romans, because I wasn't invited to go to Israel, Romans 10, verse 9. I wasn't invited to go, you know, to Israel. Now, Walid, brother, you know, I do love you, but you do test my patience. I'm here trying to address the needs of a brother and you're telling me, let's pray and get into today's topic as if you're rushing me because you have a schedule and I have to <clears throat> work in accord with your schedule. You know, brother, and I say this and I'm trying to be humble. I am trying now by the grace of God not to react to people who come here to egg me on or to cause division because I've heard some brothers, sisters who've been offended and won't listen to me because of that. And for their sake, I'm going to try to constrain myself where now if a troublemaker comes, 
automatically block and, and bounce. But brother, let me give you some advice on how not to get yourself blocked from this channel. Please don't tell me what to do. And please don't tell me how to run the channel. Please be patient. Let me deal with the brother who, who is opening his heart because he feels like he's failing Jesus and somehow thinks that because he's failing Jesus, Jesus won't forgive him. Okay? I know you're more concerned about your need, but let's try to be a little more Christ-like and be concerned with the needs of our weaker brethren and help them carry their burdens. Okay? In fact, Protestant believer, are you here? Are you here? Because I, I don't know. Or first and last, you're here, right? Okay, first and last. Do me a favor, brother. Post Galatians 6, verses 1 or 2. I wish Craig Smith, I could see. One thing about Craig Smith, I want to share some with you. If a person comes humbly before me and not arrogant or pontificate and try to challenge me, you will find that I try, I fail, to be as loving and kind and considerate to that brother. But if someone comes and pontificates and wants to challenge me and prove me wrong or disturb me, that's when my anger is aroused. But anyway, Galatians 6, verses 1 or 2. Everyone pay attention to this. Galatians 6, verses 1 or 2. Brethren, listen to this, Walid. And everyone listen to this. This applies to our brother Gabriel. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, meaning spiritually mature, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In other words, be careful lest you too succumb to the temptation that's overtaking that weaker brother that you're trying to help. But when you see a brother who is succumbing to some fault, restore him meekly if he's convicted and acknowledging his fault then verse 2 bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ do you see we just don't want to learn theology folks i'm praying by the power of the holy spirit as he uses me that all of us the things we learn then we live out in the power of the spirit live these truths for the glory of jesus so we're not just head knowledge or lip service but we're putting it into practice by the power of the holy spirit please holy spirit and one of the things that Jesus wants us to do is truly love one another in our deeds. And so here you're told by Paul, when a brother has been overtaken by a fault, restore him gently. But you're more concerned, hey, let's pray and let's start the session. The Bible is infinitely beautiful, Joanna, because it's the word of the infinitely beautiful God. Because God is real, he is real, which is why we exist. If there's no God, there would be no existence. And the God who really exists is the God revealed in the Bible. The Bible is his voice. And when the Holy Spirit gives you eyes to see, you'll be blown away by the Bible because you'll be blown away by the God who produced it. Okay, sorry. Like I said, my connection's no good, but let's bear with it. Be patient with my connection until I get my own place. Pray for the provisions that God will sustain me so that I can get on my feet and depend on no one but on the grace of God, right? Okay, now, one more passage and we begin. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. Now, expect buffering because the internet connection is not the best, but endure. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Let's read. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Here's how we see the love of God, how we perceive the love of God, how God has shown his love to us, revealed his love to us, right? Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's goods, if you have material wealth, material possession, pay attention, and seeth his brother have need, so you've been blessed financially and you have a brother in need, right? And shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. And you're not moved to compassion to then help your brother in need financially. 
How dwelleth the love of God in him? Where is the love of God in you? My little children, verse 18, etch it in your hearts, in your mind, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't tell me you love me. Show me you do. I'm fallen. I'm homeless. I'm hungry. I'm lonely. Jesus says, if you truly love me, you better go and show that person your love by your actions. Did you catch it? So don't tell me you love Gabriel, who's now opening up his heart to you, telling you he feels worthless, he feels like Jesus won't love him, and ignore him, then that means we are liars and hypocrites. Right? Don't tell me you love Jesus and you have a widow down the street, a widow in your neighborhood who has no family members and struggling financially, and you've been blessed over abundantly, and you do nothing to help her financially, don't tell me the love of Jesus is in you. Are you with me here? You with me here, right? Let me give you one more on this since we're on this theme. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Exactly, Raz. So you just took the words out of my mouth. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Please, let's stop loving in word. James 2, 14 to 18. And may God purify my heart to do it for his glory, not for selfish gain. James 2, 14, 18. Read. What doth it profit, my brethren? Of what profit is it? Though a man say he hath faith but has no works, can such faith save him? That kind of faith save you. Now watch what he says. Notice again the example. It's always about someone in need and proving your faith and love by coming to the need of that someone. Notice, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace. God bless you. May he provide your needs. Be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. You tell them, may God provide for you, and yet you yourself do nothing to provide for them, to be used of God to provide for them, right? <clears throat> what doth it profit? What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath no works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. Can you prove to me you have faith in your heart? See, I don't have access to your heart. I don't know what's in your heart. I can only see what's in your heart by your deeds. So if you tell me I have faith, but you don't show me by your deeds, how do I know you have faith? I'm not God. I don't see in your heart. So James is saying, enough lip service. I will show you my faith by my deeds. You want to know that I'm born, born again? made alive in the spirit, a heart filled with love for Jesus. Here's how you're going to know. Watch my deeds. Watch my deeds. And notice the example he gives. One of the deeds showing that Jesus lives in you. Pay attention. Pay attention now. One of the deeds, the fruits showing that Jesus lives in you, that your heart is filled with the spirit, made alive by the spirit, is you come to the need of your brothers and sisters financially. A widow needs help. You help her. A poor family struggling to pay their bills, struggling to have enough food on the table, especially for their kids. You go to RUA to make sure their groceries they have an overabundance of groceries. You see the point? Is it clear now? So if that's clear, we can begin. So from now on, I'm going to leave you this. Don't worry, medic. Whatever you give is a blessing because God can take even your penny and multiply it to bless me. So don't worry about how much you give, and never be sorry for how much you give. Just say, Lord, here's my two mites, like the widow. But you're a God of wonder. From two mites, you can multiply it and turn it into millions, like he did with the few loaves and, and fish. 
He fed 5,000, and another occasion he fed 4,000. As long as you give from your heart, and as you, long as you give sincerely, and as long as you give sacrificially, God will multiply it for his glory. Okay, the ones who, okay, if you guys want my, how to send via PayPal, because someone just asked me, here it is. Here's my email, because the sister asked me about PayPal. Here it goes. Save it. Okay. Save it. Hold on. Here it goes. And again, thank you for reminding me. Sam underscore S-H-M-N at Hotmail.com. That's for PayPal. Sam underscore S-H-M-N at Hotmail.com. And that reminds me again, a lot of new supporters have joined in the last month and actually last couple of months. I want to just again take a moment to thank all of you. Those who've been supporting me for years and those who have recently joined the team of supporting me financially, again, for Sorry. Okay, sorry. I just want to take a moment again. Sorry, it's going to be buffering like this. I want to personally thank from my heart all of you who've been supporting me for over the years and the recent ones who've joined the bandwagon, right? Join the team. I have a lot on my plate. I can't reach out and thank you personally. So I want to take time to do it via YouTube. Thank you. There is no amount that's too small. From a dollar to whatever, thank you because I know you're giving, giving from your heart because you believe the Lord Jesus has blessed me to do this work. And I pray Jesus bless you richly for standing with me prayerfully and financially, thank you. I mean it from my heart. God put in my heart to do full-time ministry in 1999. And since then, he has provided my daily needs. And even now more so, I trust in his grace because I have two precious princesses up from him, two daughters that need me to provide for them. Thank you from my heart. Lord Jesus bless you. And I beseech him to bless you for blessing me to do this work. You don't need to do it. You don't even need to be here. But you're here because the Spirit is bringing you <clears throat> and blessing you with love in your heart to trust the Spirit will use me to bless your life. Praise the Holy Spirit for the grace of using me. And praise the Holy Spirit for bringing you to teachers after his heart. And I pray I'm one of them. And I trust if I'm not, the Spirit wouldn't have brought you here. So all glory to the eternal Spirit of the Father and Son. We love you. We are in love with you. Preserve us. For the glory of Jesus. Have your way, Father, Son, and Spirit. Thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit. Bless this session. Bless the sound of my voice. Anoint my words to recall Scripture correctly, interpret it correctly for the glory of Jesus. Save me from error, from stammering, and bless your people. Cover us and wash us in the blood of Jesus, even our loved ones. My angels, wash them in the blood of Jesus. Seal us by the Spirit and fill us with passion and fire and an anointing from the Holy Spirit. To glorify Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Save us from error. Save us from sin. Save us from the evil one. And transform us to become more like Jesus. Open our eyes to see the depth of your word. And to know your word and live your word. Proclaim your word and love your word. And die for your word. Because you are worthy, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name. Okay, with that said, are we ready to discuss... Joe's witnesses in the deity of Christ. And by the way, I forgot to mention, I forgot this. It's now in the description box of yesterday's session. I forgot to mention, I actually have an article, a post on my blog regarding the difference in meaning between Hades and Gehenna. Here's the link. Folks, save that link. I'm going to post it again. Save that link. Everything I covered last night, well, when I say everything, the main points, because in an article you can't go as in-depth because the article will be too long and no one's going to read it. Save the link. Here's the link that provides, provides you with the different words used in the King James Bible <clears throat> that is typically rendered as hell. There you'll find a discussion where I show... Gehenna is different from Hades, Hades, which in Hebrew is Sheol. And I just demonstrate what the differences in the words happen to be. 
so that with the session, now you have an article, all right? Save the link. Here it is. Now, here is my post on Jehovah's Witnesses and the Deity of Christ, where I use the New World Translation, New World Translation of the Jehovah Witnesses to prove that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh, even from their own perverted translation. Okay? Even from their own perverted translation. And by the way, folks, this is not the or only article I have where I use the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the Holy Spirit. On my blog, listen to this. On my blog, I have several articles and series where I use the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove the Trinity, the deity of Christ. And I have one particular post using the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove that the Holy Spirit is a person from their own Bible. Did you guys know that? Did you guys know that? On my blog, I have a post using the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove the Holy Spirit is a person, not an active force, from their own Bible. Let me see if I can get the link. Hold on. Hold on. Let me see if I can get it. I'll put it in the description box, but let's see if I can get it. Oh, boy. Come on, man. Come on. Let's see. Let me see. Give me a minute to find it. We can begin. Yep, here it goes. Oh, no, that's Jehovah's Witness, Deity of Christ. I just, I, I psyched myself up. I got, I got myself excited for no reason. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, boy. I have a series called The Series of Questions for Jehovah's Witnesses. Make sure to check that out. I hate when I can't find even my own articles on my blog. Hold on. All right. I'll try. Hold on. Come on, man. What'd it be like? Proving that, okay. Older post. Let's see. Sorry, guys, for the delay. I just want to find it, man. I think it's important if I can. All right. Can't find it. Sorry. This is what I hate when I can't find my own articles. Oh, boy. You'll find it. It's there. Okay. You'll find it. It's there. I don't know why I can't find it. I get my I get upset when I can't find stuff. Can someone slap me in the face? Put me out of my misery? Anybody? Going once, going twice. Okay, folks. I'm so stubborn, I'm trying to find it. Don't stone me, guys. Don't hate me. Okay, can't find it. Forget about it. Uh, yeah. When I find it, I'll put it in the description box. But search the blog. Search the blog. Because in the blog, I have at least a dozen articles using the Jehovah's Witnesses' own literature and own Bible to prove the Trinity, Jesus, Jehovah, God in the flesh, and the Holy Spirit is a person. Please use this information. Please use this information. Oh, first, last, found it. Can you repost? Okay. Yeah, uh, France, I have about, I would say, over 200 articles. Over 200 articles on my blog and answeringislam.net. And over 90% of my articles have to do with the Trinity, the deity of Jesus Christ, the two natures of Christ, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, salvation, the authority of Scripture, and answering objections against the Christian faith. So if you want a lot more meat, go to answeringislam.net. Look for individual authors. Look for Sam Shamoon. Go to my blog and also check out my older videos on my YouTube channel. I have sessions where I'm responding to Ahmad Didat, Jamal Badawi, Zakir Naik, Shabir Ali, Adnan Rashid, Zakir Hussein, Jehovah's Witnesses, e e Ecclesia Ni Cristo. Study the material. Use the arguments. Pass it on. Print out the articles and rebuttals, right? Even download this stuff to your own blogs and websites. Don't edit them and don't sell them. And besides, if you sell them, I get 50% of all proceeds. Find the truth. This is about the 10th million confirmation I need to write a book. Can you do me a favor then, find the truth? Here's what I need you to do so we can begin. Can you pray that if the Lord has called me to do full-time ministry, 
And if the Lord is going to keep me in ministry till I die until Jesus returns. See, again, another person just said maybe a book compilation. You see, more confirmation. Then pray God will save me from this corrupt legal system. Give me financial freedom. Protect my children. Bring them to me. Plant me where I don't have these satanic distractions. And I promise by the grace of God, I will focus on a book. Right now, I'm still going through some trials. I'm not completely out of the wilderness. Right? I'm not completely out of the wilderness. See? Three confirmations independently. Did you catch it? France Toma, look what he just said. This, By the way, if you want a sign, sign that God is telling you something, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, if you have two or three witnesses or more independently from one another telling you the same thing and they're not aware that the others have told you the same thing, that is definitely God telling you something. So if you have two or three witnesses telling you a specific thing independently from one another, that's God speaking to you. So notice, I just got three witnesses right now. Franz Toma. I know people have said this, but just wondering, those blocks can't be put together and make a book? You have too much knowledge not to try a book. Uh, honestly, now notice, he just said that after this uh, Sila Lumen said something similar. Let me find it. And then our other brother, right? So you got three people in the same session get, confirming I need to write a book, right? So I hear you, Lord. I hear you. We belong to you. Our life is yours. Fill us with the spirit to do what you want us to do. Because apart from you, we have no life. You are our life, Father, Son, and Spirit. And in Jesus' name, give me the grace to be able to do that book. I will do it in Jesus' name. Okay? Now, let's begin. Are we ready? So, Protestant believer found the link. Did you find it? No, Protestant believer. You just broke my heart again, Protestant believer. I was talking about a post I did using the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Holy Spirit is a person. You gave me a link on the Archangel Michael. You shattered my heart, bro. I had so much confidence in you that you had found the right link. But here you misled me and deceived me. And this is what I get after all that I pay you for posting verses, which is nothing because I basically pay you nothing. Oh, he found it. Let's see. Did he find it? <laughs> Hold on, man. Hold on. I probably spoke presumptuously. Yes, he found the link. He found the link. Oh, boy. And here I was condemning you and about to I was about to fire you. Here's the link. He found the link. Oh, how you redeemed yourself. Oh, how you restored yourself from falling from my favor. There it goes. That's the link. Yes, I will give him a raisin. That's the link, folks. There's the link. Save it. Thank you, brother. There's the link. That link is where I use the Joe Witness Bible to prove the Holy Spirit is a person from their own Bible. Okay, in Jesus' name, let's begin. Are we ready? Witness translation so they can read along because I have all of this in my article. Okay, so if he, since he can do it by the grace of God, right? Oh, you can't do it? That's fine. Not a, it's not my home. I'm living at my brother's home and not permanently. Okay, so you can do it, Protestant? Yeah, like I said, it's going to buffer for a few seconds, so don't worry about it. Can you post from the New World Translation? Okay, all right, let's begin. I'm going to use the Jehovah Witness Translation to demonstrate that their own Bible testifies that Jesus, God, Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty because he's the creator and sustainer of all things. Okay, let's start with... Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. We're using the Jehovah Witness Bible. All of these passages are in this post. All of these passages are in this post. Okay? Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now, I may have to 
use my post because in one particular citation, we're going to have to use the Jehovah Witness Greek interlinear translation of the New Testament because in their English translation, they butcher a particular New Testament passage. But with that said, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Using the Old Testament to show that Jesus in the New Testament is Jehovah God Almighty. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. You alone are Jehovah. You alone are Jehovah. You made the heavens. Yes, the heaven of the heavens and all their army, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them alive, and the army of the heavens are bowing down to you. So pay attention. Jehovah created the heavens and the earth. He made the heavens and the earth and everything in them. The hosts that live in heaven and everything on earth, he preserves all of them. He gives all of them life and all the hosts of heaven, all the angels bow down to him. Did we get that part so far? Is that clear? Before I move on, did you get it? So if you ask the Old Testament saints, who made the heavens and the earth and everything in them? Jehovah. The host of heaven. Worship who? Jehovah. Who preserves the heavens and the earth and everything in them? Jehovah. Does Jehovah use anyone to help him? Absolutely not. He does it all alone. He does it by himself. Job chapter 9 verse 8. Job chapter 9 verse 8. Not No, it's not buffering. It's buffering on your end, JDL. Everyone's getting it. He spreads out the heavens by himself, and he treads upon the highways of the sea. Folks, when Jehovah spread out the heavens, did he do it with the aid of someone, or did he do it alone by himself? Are you reading what their translation says? Jehovah spread the heavens by himself. No one helped him. This is confirmed. Sorry, it's buffering. Sorry about that. Like I said, it's going to buffer here and there. By himself, no one helped him. This is confirmed in Isaiah 44, 24. Isaiah 44, 24. Isaiah 44, 24 confirms this in Jesus' name. Sorry, buffering bad now. Okay, Isaiah 44, 24 confirms this. He did it by himself all alone. Isaiah 44, 24 in their own Bible. Use their own Bible to prove it. This is what Jehovah says, your repurchaser who formed you since you were in the womb. I am Jehovah who made everything. I stretched out the heavens by myself. Emphasize that to them. By myself. And I spread out the earth. Who was with me? Rhetorical question. Who was with me when I stretched out the heavens and spread out the earth? Was there anyone with me? No one was with me. Hold on. Let me charge my phone, uh, my computer. Hold on. You got it? Hold on. Let me. Sorry, guys. Hold on. Okay. Charge the computer. Okay. So good, right? Okay. Now. It gets better now. It gets better. Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Pay attention here. Everyone who's called by my name and whom I created for my own glory. My own glory. Did Jehovah create anyone for the glory of another? Sorry, hold on. Someone's at the door. Sorry about that, guys. Hold on. Hey, what's up, oh. what's up bro? Sorry about that. My oldest brother, the firstborn's here. What's up, bro? 
So pray for my oldest brother. He's letting me stay until I get my own place and using his internet. I couldn't do this without him. Yes, right. But Magzit Lagano. So they can see that you look like me. Hold on, hold on. You want to see my oldest brother if he looks like me? Hold on. Hey, what do you have, bro? I want them to see if they look at each other. It's my, these are my Christian brothers. I teach them all over the world. This is my oldest brother right here. Hadiz, you want to come on? See that handsome guy? Do we look like each other? Old guy. He's the oldest one. My other brother is coming. We're going to get a place. Pray for him because of his kindness. I'm able to use the internet. So you bless this man, his wife, his daughters, and grandchildren. See, bless you too. Pakistan, in Europe, in all the world. Right? Bless you guys. Now, who's better looking, him or me? Uh, I don't know about that. All right. What's up, bro? Zimara, we look like each other. Yeah, that tells you. We all look like each other. Same father, same mother. So again, coming back to the issue, Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. Twins, right? But he's a skinnier version of me. And my older brother looks like me too. He's coming. We're going to get a place and live together. Anyway, Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. You saw it says that Jehovah, when he created, yeah, we we're speaking a certain buddy. When he created... Did he create for the glory of another, or did he create for his own glory? And by the way, if you guys don't know, I'm the youngest of six. We're four boys, two girls. He was the firstborn. I'm the baby. I'm the youngest of six. Okay, so now as we focus here, <clears throat> he created for his own glory. Now, Isaiah 43, 20 to 21. Isaiah 43, 20 to 21. Isaiah 43, 20 to 21. Okay. The wild beast of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I provide water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert for my people, my chosen one to drink, the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. Did you catch it? Jehovah says even the animals will praise him because the, Jehovah's, uh, the animals receive their sus sustenance as the Lord loosens my tongue from Jehovah. Jehovah says, even the animals praise me because they know that I provide for them. And then he talks about the people that he created for himself, the people whom I formed for myself. So guys, focus. Not only does Jehovah sustain animals, sustain creation, he creates for himself for his own glory. He doesn't create for another. He doesn't create for the glory of someone else. Did you guys catch it? Did you catch what the New World Translation of the Bible says? Jehovah created for his own glory, for himself, not for the glory of another. He didn't create anything for another. All right. Isaiah 45, 12 and 18. This is their translation now. Isaiah 45, 12 to 18. Okay. Watch here. Isaiah 45, 12 to 18. Pay attention. Isaiah 45, verse 12 and verse 18, a New World Translation. It's all from their Bible. Learn to use their Bible. I made the earth and created man on it. I stretch out the heavens with my own hands. Here's what I want you to pay attention. If, if it wasn't clear that Jehovah created all things by himself and for his glory, this should make it clear. He says, my own hands, my own hands stretched out the heavens, and I give orders to all their army. Who did not create it simply for nothing, but formed it to be inhabited. I am Jehovah, and there is no one else. Now, verse 18. For this is what Jehovah says, the creator of the heavens, the true God, the one who formed the earth, its maker, who firmly established it. Go back to 12 and see. I stretch out the heavens with my own hands. You don't get any clearer than this, that Jehovah created all things by himself for his glory. Didn't use anyone, right? You don't get clearer than this. Isaiah 48, 13. Isaiah 48, 13. Isaiah 48, 13. Watch here. My own hand laid the foundation of the earth. And my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. 
Okay, guys, can I ask you a question? How many more passages do we need to read for it to sink in? Jehovah God alone by himself with his own hands, meaning his own power, created the heavens and earth and everything in them, meaning no one assisted, helped Jehovah in creating anything. Could it be any clearer? Are you catching it? Could it be any clearer? Is it clear? My own hands, my own hand, my right hand, by myself, who is with me for my own glory, for myself. Okay. How does this prove that Jesus has to be God Almighty? John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Watch here. John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Watch here. All things came into existence through him. Problem. This is talking about Jesus, the word. All things came into existence through him. Not some things, but every created thing came into being through the agency of Jesus. And apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. What has come into existence by means of him was life, and the life was the light of men. Problem, Jehovah Witness. Problem. Jehovah said, by myself, all alone, no one was with me, my own hands, my own hand, my right hand, for myself, for my own glory. And yet the New Testament says, the Father employed the Son, the Word, the Logos, to bring the entire creation into being, and nothing came into being apart from the Logos. Problem. Either the New Testament contradicts the Old Testament because those witnesses are trying to tell us that Jesus is the first creature of Jehovah. And that means Jehovah used this creature to bring everything else into being, which contradicts the plain teaching of the Old Testament. Or Jesus cannot be a creature. He must be Jehovah, one with the Father. Jesus is our Passover lamb. You're not getting it. According to the Old Testament, who was the mighty God that created the heavens and the earth? Jehovah. Did Jehovah have any creature helping him create anything? No, he did it alone. So to tell me that Jesus is a mighty God doesn't settle the contradiction for them because they're telling me Jesus is the first creature of Jehovah. And through that creature, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth contradicting the plain reading of all these passages from their own Bible, Jehovah created by himself all alone, who was with him by his own hand, his right hand, his own hands for his glory for himself. John 1, 10. John 1, verse 10. It's going to get worse for them. He was in the world, and the world came into existence through, through him, but the world did not know him. Folks, did we not just read? Did we not just read in Isaiah 44, 24, and Isaiah 40, 48, 13, that the earth, the world, was founded by Jehovah alone, by his right hand? Did we not just read that? In Isaiah 48, 13, Isaiah 45, 12. Didn't we just read that? Right? <clears throat> Sorry, guys. What's buffering? I wait. So don't worry about it. We're back. Okay. But hold on. If it's Isaiah 44, 24, Isaiah 45, 12, and Isaiah 48, 13, Jehovah spread out the earth. There was no one with him. He laid the foundation of the earth with his own hands, with his right hand, meaning no one did it. How can John 1.10 be true then when it says that the entire world, meaning this earth, came into existence through Jesus, the word? You catch it? 
Is it making sense? Either we have a contradiction with the Old Testament or the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. Jesus is no creature. He must be Jehovah, one with the Father. But it gets even worse for them. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It's going to get worse for them, their own translation. Hebrews chapter 1, let's read 2 and 3. We'll read 2 and 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. Their own translation. Watch here. I hope this is not boring you. It's educating you, challenging you, and emboldening you. Notice, now at the end of these days, he has spoken to us by means of a son. So Jehovah now speaks by his son. God the Father speaks by his son. Now pay attention. Whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the systems of things, through whom he made the ages, meaning all the created order, this present age and everything in it, this age of heaven and earth and the age to come, Jehovah made it through the Son. But wait, hold on. Hebrews, you know the Old Testament. You quote it copiously, showing that you're very familiar with the Old Testament. Don't you know the Old Testament says Jehovah created heavens and the earth, everything in them, by himself, all alone, with his own hands, <clears throat> with his own hand, his right hand, for his glory, for himself, no one was there? So then how are you now contradicting that by saying, the system of things, all the created orders, this present created order and the created order to come were made by God through his son. If the son is a creature, what are you doing? What are you saying? Hebrews 1.3. Let's finish it with Hebrews 1.3. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact representation of his very being. And he, the son, sustains all things by the word of his power. Okay, now I'm really confused. Now, Maya chapter 9, verse 6, and Isaiah 43, 20 to 21 says, It is Jehovah who preserves all creation, who gives life to all creation, and he's the one who gives even the wild animals their sustenance. But in Hebrews 1, 3, you are told right now that it is the Son's powerful word, his word of power, his powerful word that sustains all creation and guides all creation to its intended goal. How does that work? How does that work? Can you help me? Understand how does that work? How can Jesus, if Joe's witness is right, is a creature, sustain the entire creation and everything in it, preserve the entire creation and guide the entire creation to God's intended purpose and goal for it, by his powerful word, if he's a creature, if the New Testament doesn't contradict the Old Testament. Yep, Jesus is the one who sat on God's right hand. Did you catch it? Whose powerful word sustains everything? Jesus's. But it's going to get better. Are you ready for what's even better? Yep, yeah, shows that he's all powerful. It's going to get better. Yep, as first last said, not only would you have a contradiction of Jesus as a creature, but then that means Jesus, the creature, sustaining himself. A creature is sustaining himself as part of the creation. A creature is sustaining himself as part of creation. Are they? No, I don't think so. No, All right. Okay, but no, Hebrews 1.8 is not good, Riaz, in their translation. One thing, Riaz, you need to learn. You need, to, you need to learn their Bible to know what to quote, what not to quote. Hebrews 1.8 isn't the best. It's what follows Hebrews 1.8 that's better. Are you ready now? Another thing you need to know, you need to know what passages to quote, what passages not to quote. But Can we go up? All right. Hold on. Connection, oh, yes, bye. Hold on. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Because connection, but it's okay. We'll see. Hold on. Let's see. Hold on, guys. Hold your horses. Yeah, no, yeah. But it's Klatela Router, Lila Klata. Sir, we'll see. Let's go up. Hold on, guys. I'm going to take you on a tour. Three hour tour. Hold on. All right. Okay. Now, hopefully, everything will go smooth. Let's now check it out. Check it out. Check it out. One second. Sorry, it's a little dark. Hey, remember, this is life. Okay. Now, don't worry. The light's not going to be in your face. Don't be scared. I'm here. Okay. With that said, 
All right. You guys okay? Picture's not going to be too clear, but this is the best we got. You with me there? Everything all right? You okay? It's all good in the hood? Okay. All right. Okay, now. Sorry about that. The resolution won't be too good, but it's okay. Okay. Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. What jaw curtain, man? The curtain's already drawn. Why don't you face the east, Andrew? Andrew, you're quite demanding. You better be not you better not be like that with your wife. You're not gonna stay married for too long. Okay, Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. Okay. You with me here? Let's read. Guys, let's read. Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. Read with me. Focus on what's gonna happen here. But about the son, he says, God is your throne forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of up uprightness. Let's po post verse 8 one more time. Sorry about that, Protestant. Because I want to now show you that you can't just quote any verse. You have to know what verses to quote from their Bible. Okay, just stop at verse 8. Okay, everyone pay attention. This is the Jehovah Witness Bible. Notice how they translate Hebrews 1.8. In their translation... In their translation, it doesn't say that Jesus is God. Notice when they translate Hebrews 1.8, they say, but about the Son, he says, and this is the Father speaking to the Son and about the Son. Pay attention, folks. I need your attention so I don't confuse you. In Hebrews 1, the inspired author is having the Father speak to the Son and about the Son. So here he says, about the Son, he, the Father says, God is your throne forever and ever. Did you catch the translation? In the King James Version, it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, where Jesus is called God by the Father, not in the Jehovah Witness Bible. In the Jehovah Witness Bible, the Father doesn't call Jesus God, but he says to Jesus, Your throne is God. God is your throne, meaning God is your authority. God is the one who gave you your royal authority. So you see why I said, Riaz, Hebrews 1.8 is not powerful in their translation. So you have to know what verses to use and what verses to avoid in their translation. Do you see it? So if you're going to witness to Joe's witnesses, if God has called you to witness to them, you need to know their Bible. You need to know what to use and what not to use. And I'll come back and I'll show you that in a minute. But now, let's reread it now. Before we read it, here's what I need you to focus. Focus here. The author of Hebrews is having the Father speak to the Son and address the Son. So it's the Father talking to the Son and about the Son. With that in mind, notice what the Father says to the Son and about the Son. Please pay attention. Their translation. But about the Son, he says, God is your throne forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. This is the father speaking about the son and to the son. So the father is telling the son, you love righteousness. So the father is saying, you son, love righteousness and you hated lawlessness. That is why God, your God, anointed you with the oil of exaltation more than your companions. Now here's the knockout. Here is the knockout. Notice what the father goes on to say to the son. And this is the father speaking. And he's speaking to the Son. And at the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Wow. The author of Hebrews has the Father telling the Son, Son, you are the Lord, who at the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands, my Son. Did you catch what the Father just said to the Son? You, Son, are the Lord, who at the beginning of creation created the heavens and the earth. You, Son are the Lord <clears throat> who laid the foundations of the earth and made the heavens with your own hands. And then watch 11 and 12, the father speaking to the son. They will perish. The heavens and the earth will perish, my son, right? But you will remain. And just like a garment, they will wear out. And you, my son, you, he's talking to the son, you will roll them up, wrap them up just as a cloak. And as a garment, they will be changed 
But you, my son, are the same, and your years will never come to an end. Did you just catch what the father said to the son in, in Hebrews 1? Andrew, you're trying hard, and you disappoint me every time. How can the father be speaking about the father and to the father when Hebrews 1, it's the father speaking to the son? Show me in the context where the father is now speaking to himself about himself. So is the father schizophrenic? So the father all of a sudden starts speaking to himself and about himself? The context starts with the father speaking to the son and about the son. How does it change from the father now speaking to himself? So he's talking to himself and saying, hey, self, you are the one, which means me, who laid the foundation of the earth, and you are the one who made the heavens with your hands, which is basically me speaking to me about me. Really? The context is clear. The context is clear. The father is speaking to the son about the son. Okay, now, did you see what the father said to the son? He called him Lord, and he said, You are that Lord who at the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Unlike creation, which wears out, and you will roll them up like a garment, you remain the same, and your years never end. Did you see what the father just did? Did you see what the father just did? I don't know if it's sinking in. The father just praised glorified and honored the son as the creator and sustainer of the heavens and the earth, glorifying the son and praising the son for making the heavens and the earth, saying the heavens are the work of your own hands, meaning you made them by your power. And unlike creation, you son are immutable, unchangeable, remain forever. And this is the father saying it to the son. Did everyone catch it? But folks, we have a problem. We just read, we just read in Isaiah 45, 12, Isaiah 48, 13, <clears throat> Isaiah 44, 24, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth by himself. There was no one there. Jehovah stretched out the heavens by his own hand, laid the foundation of the earth with his own right hand, not someone else's hands. But here the father says, you the son are the Lord. You <clears throat> laid the foundations of the earth. You spread out the heavens by your own hands. You're the one who sustains them and rolls them up. And your, your years remain forever. How can the father say it was the son's hands that stretched out, spread out the heavens. It was the son who laid the foundations of the earth. It is the son who then rolls them up like a garment because he's the one who sustains them. And unlike creation, the son remains the same forever and ever. How can the father say that to the son and about the son when the Old Testament says that's a description that only fits Jehovah and Jehovah alone? Is, is it sinking in? Is it sinking in? But it gets better, folks. It gets better. Let me show you how good it gets. Again, from their translation, we're going to look at Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. And do me a favor, Protestant. Before you post, guys, just take one minute. Don't text because I want you to see what quotation the author of Hebrews applied to the Son. Compare Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 with Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. With Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Watch here. Watch what's going to happen. Here's where the author of Hebrews is quoting from. Watch here. Watch what happens, guys. Don't quote anything yet, friend. Just I want you to read. So, Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, with Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Watch what happens. When you see where he's quoting from, it's going to blow your mind away. Read the citation of Hebrews. At the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Watch.
Just be patient before you post text. They will perish, but you will remain. And just like a garment, they will all wear out. Watch here. And you will wrap them up just as a cloak, as a garment, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never come to an end. Now notice where he's quoting from. Long ago, you laid the foundations of the earth. That's Psalm 102, 25, 27. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. Just like a garment, they will all wear out. Just like clothing, you will replace them, and they will pass away. Now notice 27. But you are the same, and your years will never end. So Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 is a quotation of Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Let's see who is being addressed in Psalm 102. Do me a favor, Protestant. Post Psalm 102, verse 1 and verse 12. Psalm 102, verse 1 and verse 12. Who is being referred to and addressed in Psalm 102? Psalm 102, verse 1 and verse 12. O Jehovah, hear my prayer. Let my cry for help reach you. But you remain forever, O Jehovah, and your fame will endure for all generations. Did you guys catch it? The psalm is about Jehovah. It's a psalm praising Jehovah, praying to Jehovah, and acknowledging Jehovah as the one who created the heavens and the earth, who remains forever, unlike creation. And yet this psalm is now quoted by the Father in reference to the Son. So Hebrews has the Father quoting the words of Psalm 102 about Jehovah and applying it to the Son, describing the Son as that Jehovah God worshipped in Psalm 102. I want it to sink in before I move on. Did it sink in? Did it sink in? Psalm 102 is about Jehovah God. Jehovah God is being praised and glorified for being the one who laid the foundation of the earth, right, and stretched, stretched out the heavens with his own hands, who remains the same forever, unlike creation, which is wearing out. And yet Hebrew says those words of the psalmist are actually about the son, and it's the father saying those words to the son, glorifying the son, praising the Son and acknowledging the Son to be that Jehovah God who created and who sustains all things and remains the same forever. And this is just the Jehovah Witness Bible and not some other translation. We didn't even quote another. We're just quoting the Jehovah Witness Bible. Is it sinking in? Another thing you're supposed to catch is when it says, at the beginning, in the beginning, that's an echo of Genesis 1. Let's look at Hebrews 1.10 again. Well, Hebrews 1.10. Hebrews 1.10. Let's look at Hebrews 1.10 again. And at the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. When it says at the beginning, the psalmist is referring to Genesis 1.1. Let's go back to Genesis 1.1 and see what is he referring to. Remember heavens and earth? Watch Genesis 1.1. At the beginning, in the beginning. Now notice Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1. I don't know why you put 10, Protestant. You're really dropping the ball. I'm going to have to fire you. right? In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Did you catch it? Hebrews 1 is identifying Jesus as that God who in Genesis created the heavens and the earth. At the beginning, in the beginning, who created the heavens and the earth? At the beginning, in the beginning, who created the heavens and the earth? Jesus Christ. Is it sinking in? Question. How could the New Testament writers, specifically Hebrews, Ascribe the creation of the heavens and the earth to Jesus Christ. And how could the author of Hebrews quote Psalm 102, which identifies Jehovah as the unchanging creator and sustainer of the heavens and the earth, and apply all of that to Jesus Christ if Jesus is a creature when the Old Testament is clear 
Jehovah by himself, all alone, with his own hands, created the heavens and the earth and sustains them. Because he's not a creature. That's why what is said about Jehovah in his role as creator, sustainer, and as the unchangeable Lord of creation could be ascribed to Jesus because Jesus isn't a creature. Yeah, the router is right here, Protestant, by the way. So I'm probably going to stay here from now on. Is it making sense? Are you getting it? Before I move on to the next point. For those of you who are Trinitarians, who have eyes to see by the Spirit, do you see how amazingly clear the Bible is, even in a perverted translation of the Bible, that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh and that God is a Trinity? And this is from a perverted translation. Imagine reading an accurate translation like the King James. Clear, right? Okay. But we're still not done. Now you're going to see their dishonesty in translation. But even in their dishonesty, they still have a problem. Now notice how they butcher Colossians 1. Let's go to Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Yep, he does have a sense of your medic. But here's the perversion. Here's where you're going to see they perverted the text. Here's their translation of Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now notice what they do here. Here's where I need you to pay attention. Because by means of him, all other things were created. Do you see what they did? They inserted the word other. Count how many times they're going to insert the word other. By means of him, the firstborn of God, all other things were created in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether there are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things, and by means of him, all other things were made to exist. Wow. They inserted the word other four times because they didn't want to translate accurately because an accurate translation says, by means of Christ, all things were created in heaven, on earth, whether thrones, dominions, powers, principalities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. And by the way, let me give you their own Greek interlinear. Their own Greek interlinear. Here's the link. Here's the link. It's in my article. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to click on the link. Don't take my word for it. Thank you for this last he posted it. Go and see that the Greek, their own Greek, the Greek they use, doesn't say all other things. It says tapanta, the all. The Greek says all things, everything. Click on it and see. Can you click on it and see? It's tapanta, the all. Does everyone see it? Yep, they did. They compounded the deceit by removing brackets from the word other, giving you the impression that the word other is there. Do you see here? Let me read you the translation from the Greek. I just gave you the link. Here's the Greek. It's not going to be smooth, but I'm going to read it. Okay. I'm not going to read the Greek. It's Hati. Well, I can read the Greek. All right. Hati. Well, what's the point of reading the Greek? En auto ectiste. Tapanta, Hati, and, and again, I'm giving the Erasmian butchering of the Greek. Forgive me, don't stone me. Hati and auto, ectiste, tapanta. Entois, ranois, kai, epi, <clears throat> teis geis, ta orata, ka. Anyway, why am I even reading Greek? Anyway, let me just read the translation. Because in him it was created the all things. Do you see their interlinear? Their interlinear says in him was created the all things. Do you see it? Do you see their Greek? Please, guys, don't take my word for it. Can you click on it, Vine, everyone else, and see 
confirm that the very Greek text they use says that in him, en auto, ectiste ta panta, all things. Do you guys see it? Okay, let me continue reading the translation of the literal Greek, okay? Because in him it was created the all things in the heavens and upon the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, the all things, tapanta, through him, the autu, and into him, kai is autan, it has been created, ektistai. Now notice 17, and he is before all things, and the all things in him, it has stood together. So next they can. Do you see that their own Greek interlinear confirms all things, not all other things, were created in, through, and for Jesus, and Jesus is before all things, and all things are kept together in him. Do you see it? Can I ask you guys a question? In Colossians 1.17, it says Jesus is, present tense, before all things, meaning all creation. Now, folks, help me understand. If Jesus exists before all creation, because all things means all creation. If he exists before all creation came into being, how can he be a creature? If he is before all things, meaning he's before the entire creation came into being, then that means he's not created, right? It means he's uncreated, he's eternal, and separate from all creation. Right? And also, if it says that all things were created in him, through him and for him, how could he be part of all things, be part of all creation, if all things means all all creation, and all creation came into being in him, through him, and for him. Well, if he made all things, all things being all creation, and he is before all things, then how can he be part of creation when he is before all creation, and all creation came into being in him and through him? Doesn't that prove that he's separate from all creation and uncreated and eternal by nature? Do you understand the implication of just taking it literally? It doesn't say all other things. And do you see why now they added the word other four times? They couldn't translate it literally because they knew if someone read it the way it appears in the Greek, the first thing you would tell yourself, well, wait, if all things came into being by Christ and through Christ and for Christ, and Christ exists before all things, and all things means all of creation, then that means he's older than all creation. He exists before all creation. He's separate from all creation. Therefore, he's not a creature. He's uncreated. Right? So you see why they had to word, add the word other four times? So what you need to do is show them their Greek. You need to show them their Greek and say, wait, wait, uh, Mr. Jehovah Witness, Miss Jehovah Witness, I have your Greek interlinear, which is online for free, and I gave you the link. How come the word other is not in the Greek? The Greek says ta panta means the all. Why then did you add the word other four times in your translation when the Greek doesn't have other? Why would you do that? What are you trying to hide from me? But let's even go with the word other. Let's go to Colossians 1.16. Let's, let's go with the word other. Let's go to Colossians 1.16. Let's look at it again. The word other. It's, in all, it's all in my article. But here, let me give you the link again. Let's go with the word other. Let's agree with them. Read with me. Because by means of him, all other things were created in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships, or governments, or authorities. All other things have been created through him and for him. Okay, let's even go with other. Did you catch it? All other things in heaven and earth were created for Jesus. Do you see that last part? For him? For him? 
Do you see it? For him? Do you see it says all other things were created for Jesus, for him? Do you see that? I want to make sure you're getting it before I move on. You guys got to all get it. Do you see it says in their translation all other things were created for Jesus? For him, him meaning Jesus, right? But this contradicts Isaiah 43, 21. Isaiah 43, 21 says the things on earth were created for Jehovah. So even in this translation, you still have a problem. How can all other things be created for Jesus when the Old Testament is clear? Jehovah created things on earth for himself, not for another. Here's Isaiah 43, 21. The people whom I formed for myself. No, you didn't, Jehovah. Because according to the Jehovah Witnesses in Colossians 1.16, the people you formed, you formed for Jesus. So Jehovah, how can you say in the Old Testament, you created these people for yourself, but then New Testament, you created all things on earth for Jesus? You catch it now? That even in their rendering, they have a contradiction? Even in their rendering? But then it gets worse. Let's let's look at Colossians 1.17. It gets worse. Colossians 1.17. Watch this. Colossians 1.17. It gets worse. Because now watch their translation here. Also, he is before all other things, and by means of him, all other things were made to exist. Now, guys, did you catch the last part? Everything else in heaven and earth are sustained by Jesus. Jesus, this creature, is sustaining everything else in heaven and on earth. But wait, this contradicts Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, Jehovah is the one who preserves everything in heaven and on earth. But Colossians 1.17 says, this creature, according to Joe's witnesses, he's the one who keeps everything, sustains everything in heaven and on earth. Does that mean he's also sustaining himself? Do you see that in Nehemiah 9.6, their translation? And you, Jehovah, preserve all of them alive. But no, Colossians 1.17 says, Jehovah is using this creature to keep everything alive. How can the creature keep everything alive, everything alive, is sustained, preserved in this creature when the Old Testament says it's Jehovah who's preserving everything alive. And does that mean that Jesus is also sustaining himself? A creature is sustaining himself? Is it making sense that they have problems even in their perverted translation? Or am I putting you guys to sleep? Is it making sense? Okay. So even in their perverted translation, are you seeing that even in this perversion of the Bible, they have nightmares because they could not get away from the fact that Jesus is used by the Father to create everything in heaven on earth and Jesus was used by the Father to sustain the entire creation by Jesus' own powerful word, which contradicts the Old Testament if Jesus is a creature. You catch it now? But if Jesus is not a creature, but he is eternal, he is Jehovah God Almighty, one with the Father and the Spirit, no contradiction. Yes, Jehovah alone created everything in heaven and earth. Yes, Jehovah alone sustains the heavens and the earth. Yes, all creation was made for Jehovah alone. And yet in the New Testament, that Jehovah is now identified as the Father and his Son and the Holy Spirit. That's why we're Trinitarians. You see why the church was forced to adopt the doctrine of the Trinity? There is no other doctrine that makes sense of what the Bible teaches as a whole. 
Is this all sinking in? Ah, oh, but wait. Ah, oh, but wait. It's going to get worse for them. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Beautiful equip apologetics, Nick. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. And equip apologetics. Are you the same as King James 11? Going to heaven? Right? You're the same, right? Anyway, read with me. Here, focus now. Focus now. Because you came in with both Nicks. That's why you confused me, equip. You came with both Nicks. Unless you're a modalist, you can manifest manifest in more than one manner. But anyway, let's pay attention to Nehemiah 9.6. Pay attention to what it says. Not only does Jehovah preserve all of them. Read the last part. And you, Jehovah, preserve all of them alive. And the army of the heavens are buying down to you. Okay. Do you see it says Jehovah sustains everything in heaven and earth and all the hosts of heaven, all the angels bow down to Jehovah, right? All the hosts of heaven bow down to Jehovah, right? Here's where you're going to see again the dishonesty of the Jehovah Witness. He preserves them alive and all the hosts of heaven bow down to Jehovah. Let's look at the New World Translation, Hebrews 1, 3 and 6. Hebrews 1, 3 and 6. But notice how they translate the Greek word proskeneo. Notice their dishonesty. Hebrews 1, verse 3 and 6. Okay, pay attention here. He, Jesus, is the reflection of God's glory and the exact representation of his very being. And he, Jesus, sustains all things by the word of his power. So note that. Jesus is the one who sustains the entire creation, the system of things, by his powerful word. His powerful word is what sustains all creation. But then notice six. But when he again brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth, he, the Father, says, God the Father says, let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. <whistles> they don't even translate the Greek as let all the angels of God worship him. It says, let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. They even use a word that many people are not familiar with anymore. Did you catch it? You see how they rendered Hebrews 1.6? When God the Father commands all the angels to worship his firstborn son, they didn't render the word proskeneo as worship. They rendered as obeisance. Obeisance means to give someone respect and obey. They watered down the word in order to rob Jesus of being worshipped by all the angels. Right? But this is where you're going to have to go to my article again. Okay. Go to my article because I quote Hebrews 1 from their online rendering okay here's what i want you to do let me give it to you hold on let me give it to you one second one second let me get your link because i want you to see something watch here let me just get it hebrews 1 verse 6 from their online version because you're going to click on there they have a footnote to verse 6 Footnote to verse 6. Show them the footnote. Okay. One second. Let me just click on it. I got to get you the link. Here's the link. When you click on this link, you're going to see an asterisk at the end of the verse. Okay, folks, pay attention now. Click there. You see an asterisk at the end of the verse. Click on the asterisk. Hello. Okay, I'm confused. Sai Christian, you can hear me and Tony can hear me, right? Okay. Can you guys hear me now? You know what's ironic? Sai Christian could hear me and see me and Tony. Their connection was good. The rest of you couldn't see me, right? Okay. That's weird. Sai Christian and Tony, their connection was good. They could hear me. You guys couldn't. Okay, now. 
Do you guys see that they give you an alternate translation of the word proskaneo? Do you see it says, bow down to him. Send Hobo Momo to Hoboville. You see it says, bow down to him, right? Did everyone see that? Okay. I want to make sure you caught the link. They provide an alternate translation, bow down to him. Do you know in saying that, they end up identifying Jesus as Jehovah God. Why? Because Nehemiah 9.6 says, Jehovah preserves all creation and all the angels bow down to Jehovah. So guess what they just did? They just ended up identifying Jesus as Jehovah because in Hebrews 1.3 it says, Jesus is sustaining the entire creation, everything in heaven and earth, by his powerful word, and all the angels bow down to Jesus. So thank you, Jehovah Witness, for now identifying Jesus as Jehovah God of Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Thank you. Because in Nehemiah, it is Jehovah who preserves all things and gives them life. And in Nehemiah, all the angelic hosts bow down to Jehovah. But in Hebrews 1, 3, and 6, all the angels bow down to Jesus, God's firstborn. And it's Jesus who sustains all creation by his powerful word, thereby giving life to all creation. Good job, Jehovah Witness. Thank you. Yay. You see what they did? You see by putting in their footnote that the word proskuneo can also be rendered bow down to him. They did not realize in admitting that's what the word can mean. They further reinforce Jesus's identity as Jehovah God worshiped by Nehemiah. You see what they did? You see how they ended up actually proving Jesus is Jehovah God. By admitting in Hebrews 1.6 that the word that they rendered as do obeisance to him, that word can mean bow down to him. So if we go to that translation, again, when God brings his firstborn into the inhabitant of the earth, inhabited earth, he says, let all the angels of God bow down to him. Bow down to who? God's firstborn, Jesus Christ. But Nehemiah 9.6 says, all the hosts of heaven, meaning the angels, bow down to Jehovah. In the context of Jehovah, preserving them all alive, which is the same context in Hebrews 1. Because in Hebrews 1.3, it says, Jesus Christ preserves everything alive by his powerful word. Wow. What are you doing, Jehovah Witness? Oh, but it gets worse for them. Are you guys bored? Are you tired? Or are you ready for some more meat? Are you tired? Or are you ready for some more meat? It gets worse for them. You know why it gets worse? Here's why it gets worse. Okay. They will admit to you that Hebrews 1, 5 to 13, contain a series of citations from the Hebrew Bible. They'll admit this to you because it's clear if you start at verse 5 and read to 13, Hebrews 1, 5 to 13, cite a series of Old Testament passages. For example, don't take my word for it. They even cross-reference it in their own translation. Hebrews 1, 5, note these. We're not going to quote the verses, but I'm going to tell you where they're quoting from. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 is citing Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and 2 Samuel 7, 14. Guys, write these down. Hebrews 1, 5 quotes... Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and 2 Samuel 7, verse 14. Hebrews 1, 7 quotes Psalm 104, verse 4. Hebrews 1, 7 quotes Psalm 104, verse 4. Hebrews, verses one to nine, Hebrews verse, chapter 1, verses 8 to 9, cites Psalm 45, 6 to 7. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 to 9, quotes Psalm 45, verses 6 to 7. Okay? Hebrews 1, verses 10 to 12, which we already saw. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, quotes Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. And Hebrews 1, 13, quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. Hebrews 1, 13, quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. Everyone follow me? 
So then the question is, Hebrews 1.6 is quoting from what Old Testament passage? Hebrews 1.6, chapter 1, verse 6, is quoting what Old Testament passage? To make it easier and not to confuse everyone, Lord willing, I will do a session on Hebrews 1.6 tomorrow. Okay? But to make it easier, Hebrews 1.6 may be citing Deuteronomy 32.43 as daily gripe noted, or it may be citing Psalm 97, verse 7, in the Greek version. In the Greek version, Psalm 97, verse 7, happens to be Psalm 96, verse 7. So Hebrews 1.6, as scholars admit, is a citation from either Psalm or Deuteronomy. For the sake of time and brevity, we're going to stick with Psalm. Are we ready? Here is where Hebrews is citing from. Psalm 97, verse 7. We're going to look at the translation from the Hebrew, but then we're going to look at the Greek translation. Okay? Psalm 97, verse 7, in the New World Translation. If you can quote it for me, Protestant. Okay? I hope this is making sense because tomorrow, God willing, I'll do a part two. Okay. Psalm 97, verse 7, notice what it says. Let all those serving any carved image be put to shame. Those who boast about their worthless gods, bow down to him, all you gods. That last sentence, bow down to him, all you gods, in the Greek is rendered, worship him, all you his angels. Let's look at the Greek version. Let me get it for you. It's online. Thank God for modern technology. Let me get it for you. Okay, hold on. In the Greek, it's Psalm 96, verse 7. Psalm 96, verse 7. Now, let me tell you why this is important. Here it is, Psalm 96. Here's the link. I'll give you the link. Okay. Pantes oi angeloi autu. He gave us the Greek. Can someone now quote Psalm 96, verse 7 in English? First class gave you the Greek. Notice the last part. It says, Pantes, all, hoi, or oi, angeloi, autu. Pantes, oi, angeloi, autu. Right? But what are they supposed to do? Proskenisati, auto. Man, I'm butchering the Greek. Proskenisati, autu, pantes, oi, angeloi, autu. Okay, here's the translation of the Greek. Give Jehovah his due. You families of the earth, no, I don't know what you're doing. Protestant, you really are going to get your teeth smashed in, and I'm going to repent. I didn't say Psalm 96, verse 7, New World Translation. I said Psalm 96, 7 of the Greek. I'm going to smash your teeth, brother, and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. Here's the link to the Greek. Can someone go there? Copy and paste verse 7. Poor, poor Protestant believer. He's going to now end up becoming an Orthodox believer because I'm running away from Protestantism. Quote, Psalm 96, 7. Let all that worship graven images be ashamed, who boast of their idols. Worship him, all ye his angels. Did you catch it? Notice the last part. The Greek translates the Hebrew as, worship him, all ye his angels. Worship him, all ye his angels. Okay. Scholars think that Hebrews 1, 6 may be quoting the Greek version of Psalm 97, verse 7. Because in the Greek it says, worship him, all his angels. Okay, now folks, let me, let me ask you a question. In Psalm 96, verse 7, the angels are commanded to worship who? In Psalm 96. Forget about Hebrews now. In Psalm 96, the command to the angels to worship. Who are the angels, com uh, who are the angels commanded to worship in Psalm 96? Jehovah, right? Jehovah. Okay, Jehovah Witness, you have a problem. Jehovah Witness, you have a problem. Why? Because Hebrews 1.6 quotes a psalm where all the angels are commanded to worship Jehovah, and now the author applies it to the angels worshiping God's firstborn. In other words, the command of the angels to worship Jehovah is now directed to the angels worshiping the Son. Why would the author of Hebrews quote a text where all the angels are commanded to worship Jehovah and apply to the Son being worshipped by all the angels 
how can the angels worship the Son as they worship Jehovah if he's not Jehovah? You see what Hebrews 1.6 just did? Hebrews 1.6 quoted a passage about Jehovah being worshipped by all the angels and applied it to the Son. And so in Hebrews 1.6, it's the Father commanding all the angels to worship his Son as Jehovah. Even the Jehovah Witness translation admits Hebrews 1.6 may be quoting Psalm 97 verse 7. By making that admission, they're acknowledging that in the original context, this psalm is about angels worshiping Jehovah. So then, number one, why would God the Father command the angels to give to the Son the worship that the psalm ascribes to Jehovah when no creature can be given the worship that only Jehovah receives? That's number one. Number two, since the psalm is about worship, not simply respect, and this worship is now applied to the Son, how dare the society translate this word as obeisance and not as worship when the context of the psalm is about worshiping Jehovah and not simply giving him respect? So why did they mistranslate it? Is it sinking in? Vi and everyone else, is it sinking in? Let me repeat those two points again. Number one, this is a citation from the Old Testament where all the angels are commanded to worship Jehovah. And in Hebrews, it's now the Father commanding all the angels to worship his firstborn son. So the, the Father is commanding all the angels to give to the Son the worship that's to be given to Jehovah. So the Son is being worshipped by Jehovah. That's number one. Number two, pay attention. Since the context of this passage is about worship, not simply respect, because it's angels worshipping Jehovah, how dare the society then mistranslate the word as obeisance, meaning to show respect and obedience, and not worship when the original context it clearly refers to worship being given to God. Is that clear now? Did you guys get the two points? I repeated it again because I wanted to sink in. Thirdly, the third point, if the first two points were clear, let's look at their translation one more time. Hebrews 1.6. Let's look at tra their translation one time, one more time. Hebrews 1.6. And I'm, I'm, I'll be done with this session. I'll be done with this session. Hebrews 1 verse 6. But when he again brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth, he says, let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. Folks, can I ask you a question? In Psalm 97.7, it's addressing all the angels, all created angelic beings to worship Jehovah. Now, it's applied to all the angels worshiping the sun. Notice it doesn't say, let most of the angels, let many of the angels, let a great number of the angels. It says, all the angels are to give proskuneo, the Greek word proskuneo, to the firstborn of God. Can I ask you a question? If all the angels are commanded to reverence the Son, how can the Son be an angelic creature if all the angels are worshiping him? Is he then worshiping himself? Because in the original context, it's all the angelic creatures. It's all the angelic creatures worshiping Jehovah. Now it's all the angelic creatures worshiping God's firstborn. Well, if God's firstborn is the archangel Michael, then he's an angelic being. How then can all the angels worship the sun if the sun is also an angel, is the sun worshiping himself?
You see the nightmare the Bible is for the Jehovah Witness. Do you see how even their own perverted Bible is a nightmare for the Jehovah Witness? So in Hebrews 1.6 and Hebrews 1.10-12, to 12, two Old Testament passages referring to Jehovah. One passage, Jehovah being worshipped by all the angels. The other passage, Jehovah being glorified and praised as the unchanging creator and sustainer of all creation. And those passages are now applied to the Son by the Father. The Father commands all the angels to worship his firstborn as Jehovah. And then the Father glorifies, prays his Son as the Lord, who at the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and who made the heavens by his own hands, who then rolls up creation like a garment, but he remains the same. So the Father glorifies, praises Jesus as the Jehovah God of Psalm 102, the unchangeable creator and sustainer of all things, and commands all the angels to worship his firstborn as Jehovah. And that's in Hebrews 1, verse 6 and 10 to 12. Clear? Vine, what do you mean you don't see angels in Psalm 96.7? We just posted the Greek. It says, worship him, all you angels. Let's post it one more time. Psalm 96.7. Because, Vine, you're reading the English translation of the Hebrew. That's why I want you to pay attention. I didn't say Psalm 96.7 in your English Bible. I said Psalm 96.7 of the Greek. Because in the Greek, the Psalms are different are numbered differently. So Psalm 110 in your English Bible comes from the Hebrew. In the Greek, it would be Psalm 109. So Psalm 97, 7 in the English translation of your Hebrew would be Psalm 96, verse 7 in the Greek. Are you with me there, Bob? I just gave the link to that. Let me find it again. I just, can someone repost the link? Yep, the Septuagint, the Greek version. I just posted it too. Hmm. Can someone repost the link? Okay, Vine, there's the link. Click on it. They just posted it. I want you to click on it, Vine. I don't know why I lost the page. All right, anyway. When you click on it, Vine, go to verse 7. And read it. Tell me if you find it. And go to verse 7 and read it. This is the Greek version of your Psalm 97, 7, taken from the Hebrew. And the Greek, it's Psalm 96, verse 7. And the Hebrew would be Psalm 97, verse 7. You catching it? Before I move on? Just want to make sure you got it. So has everyone clicked on it and see that the English translation of the Greek, the Greek is Psalm 96, 7. In the Hebrew, it's Psalm 97, verse 7. In the English translation of the Greek, it's worship him, all you his angels, all ye his angels. Yes, it uses the plural vine. It's hoi angeloi. He posted the Greek. Post it again. You don't need to look at the Greek. Do you see the English vine? You're still not telling me if you see the verse. Do you see the verse? He just posted the translation in English and Greek. Right? The last part of the Greek is pantes, hoi, angeloi, autu. But in the English, do you see the English says, worship him, all you his angels, all ye his angels. And he just posted the Greek again. Pantes. Hoi angeloi autu, the Rasmian butchering of the Greek. Angeloi is plural of angel. Angeloi, angelui. I don't know how the Greeks would pronounce it. But I want to make sure Vine got it before I move on. Because I'm going to end it here and we'll do a part two tomorrow. Okay, Vine, do you see that the original context of the psalm is all the angels worshiping God, not a creature? Sorry, Grung. 
I've learned from the American butchering of the Greek. They butcher the Greek. So instead of o kuriosmu, o kuriosmu. Anyway. Yeah, th thank you. Sorry about that, bro. I have a hard time speaking English. Okay, now, Vine, I just want to make sure Vine gets it. Vine, do you see that in the psalm, in the psalm, the command is to all the angels of God to worship God, not a creature. Worship him, all you, his angels. So the angels of God are being commanded to worship God. Do you see it? That's what the Greek translation of the Hebrew says. So now, Vine, the question is, why then does Hebrews 1.6 apply to the Son? Why does Hebrews 1.6 quote a passage about all the angels worshiping God and then has the Father commanding the angels in the words of the psalm, commanding the angels to worship his firstborn if his firstborn is not Jehovah? Do you see the dilemma now? Is it sinking in? Do you want to make sure? Sinking in? Do you want to make sure Vine got it too? Thank you, Vine. Hebrews is a nightmare. Just chapter 1 is a nightmare, Vine, for Joe's witnesses. Because in Hebrews 1, Jesus is described as possessing the nature, the characteristics of Jehovah God, a psalm which speaks of Jehovah as the unchanging creator and sustainer of all things is applied to him. And the worship given to Jehovah by all angels is applied to the son. You don't get any clearer that Jesus is Jehovah God almighty in the flesh, the eternal unchangeable creator of the heavens and the earth who is worthy of the worship of his creatures, including all the angels than what you find in the book of Hebrews. And yet Hebrews clearly differentiates the Son from the Father, showing the Son is not the Father. Do you see now why we're Trinitarians, Vine? Now, let me encourage every one of you. Yes, I do. I talk to them all the time. Let me encourage every one of you. And I want you to give God the glory, the triune God glory, and know he's more real than you can imagine. And he loves you more than you can imagine. And he will fill you with wisdom, knowledge, and love, and faith, and preserve you if you believe and trust. All this information I gave you, just to show you how amazing Jesus is, and that you don't have to be a PhD or a DD. All you need to do is trust in him, believe in him, and know that he's real. And he will enable and equip you to know him, to love him, to proclaim his glory, and preserve you. By way of testimony, I'm going to glorify Christ by showing how foolish I am. By way of testimony, to encourage you. So he gets the glory, and you have no doubt he can do wonders through you if you believe. Here I am, a high school dropout who only got a GED, never went to college, never went to seminary, never went to university. A high school dropout who got a GED. And notice the wisdom and the knowledge and the power that God is revealing through such a fool like me. You, you caught what I just said? No high school diploma. I got a GD, which is an equivalent because I dropped out. No college no university, university, no seminary, only the Holy Spirit of the living God. Taking a fool like me, lost in the world, on his way to hell, set me apart, transformed me, and filled me with his love, filled me with wisdom, filled me with knowledge and faithfulness, and preserves me for his glory. Okay, do you know why I'm boasting about my foolishness? Because I am proof of 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 29. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 29, we are told God didn't choose the scholars of this age, the philosophers of this age who thought they were wise. 
he chose the things that the world considered to be foolish, the foolish things by worldly standards to raise them up, to silence the scholars of this age so that he gets the glory, not man. And I am proof of God's faithfulness. Okay. Exactly, Lisa. So, folks, what am I trying to tell you? May I decrease and Christ crucify my flesh and may Jesus shine through me. I'm not trying to boast about myself. I'm boasting in him. What am I trying to tell you? If you trust in Jesus, you can do wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit if you believe and know he's real. If a fool like me can do this, Imagine what you can do because the same Holy Spirit that lives in me lives in you. The same Holy Spirit that lived in Peter, James, and John, fishermen, lives in us. And that Holy Spirit is almighty, and he's ready to do wonders through you for the glory of Jesus. But if you believe. So let me end this session with this. Let me end this session with this. Now, I found the perfect spot in the house, Protestant. This is the router. The connection was perfect, so I'm going to start doing it up here. Okay? Let me end it with this. And Lord willing, I'll be back on tomorrow. Let me encourage you, a fool by worldly standards, a nobody by worldly standards, a broken vessel, and look at the knowledge that God is revealing through a broken vessel like me to show you he's more real than you can imagine. He is alive, and he loves us with an everlasting love. Okay, now. Let me end it with this. Jesus' friend Lazarus was dead for four days. When he approached, Martha ran out to him. Guys, pay attention. Pay attention to this. Because Jesus says something to her that he says to us today. She goes, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus answered her. Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. And then she responded, Lord, I know he'll rise at the last day on the day of resurrection. I know at the end of the age he'll rise. Jesus answered her. Guys, I need you to pay attention. Notice what he says. Jesus answered her. I am the resurrection and the life. Let me repeat it again. I am. And the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who believes in me and lives shall never die. But he didn't stop there. He said, do you believe this? And that's what he's saying us, to us today. Jesus knows who he is. He knows he's our creator, our life giver. He's our reality. Without him, we could not exist. So what he's saying to us is, who I am. I am the resurrection, the life. And if you believe in me, I will preserve you. You will never die. But then he says, but do you trust me? Do you believe this? Do you believe in me? Do you take me at my word? And are you willing to trust me with your life? And you know what Martha said? This is what Martha said. And I, on your behalf, will say, amen. We echo the words of Martha. Lord, like Martha, we respond, yes, Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Yes, we do believe, we do receive, we do trust, and we entrust our lives to you and the lives of our family. I entrust the lives of my daughters to you, for you are the resurrection life, you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. You are, like Thomas said, our Lord and our God, our love and our life. We love you, King Jesus. You are, you are, in the words of Thomas, you are, in the words of Thomas, Father, Son, and Spirit.
Yep. How ironic, right? How ironic. It, it started buffering on my end right when we're about to glorify Jesus, right? Sorry, guys. On my end, it started buffering. I couldn't see anything. Is that a coincidence? So again, we rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus by the blood of Jesus as our covering and the fire of the Holy Spirit destroying his wicked, unclean presence from us. In the words of Thomas, yes, Lord, you are our Lord and our God, our love and our life and the life of our family, the life of my daughters. Preserve us and keep us in love with you and save us, Lord Jesus. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Guys, do pray for me. Pray. Jesus makes me holy and pure and in love with him. Pray. He saves me from my flesh. Pray that Jesus Christ will protect me from this corrupt legal system. Give me favor with the locals. I stay here and not return to Chicago. Pray he brings my daughters to me and keeps them safe so I can have them again. Pray I find a place because my brother is coming. We need to find a place within a month. Pray in Jesus' name for my daily provisions to take care of my children and to get on my feet so I can do this work for the Lord. Pray he continues to fill me with wisdom and knowledge to know his word and share it with you. Pray for my YouTube page, for my uh, website, that it will go viral and that you will use the material to glorify Christ. Pray for one another to stay in love with Jesus and that we love one another. And pray the Lord either wants to keep me celibate, his will be done, to be like the Apostle Paul, or if he has a partner to share this work with me, to reveal it sooner than later, because he's worthy to carry our cross, deny ourselves, and live for him. He is worthy. And without him, there is no life. I love you guys. And more importantly, Jesus loves you more. All right? God willing, see you tomorrow. And I'll go more in-depth on Hebrews 1.6. Jesus is beautiful, isn't he? He is beauty itself. And we love you, Jesus. Love you too, Equip. Love all of you for the sake of Jesus.